Good evening. My name is Larry Alford. I'm the University Chief Librarian at the University of Toronto. Um, before we begin tonight's uh, lecture, I want to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. Uh, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work and live on this land. And I would urge you, if you're not in, in downtown Toronto as I am, to also reflect on the land on which you're living and working and, and the people, the Indigenous peoples um, from that land. Um, on behalf of the University of Toronto Libraries, I'd like to welcome you to the 23rd annual John Seltzer and Mark Seltzer Memorial Lecture. It's wonderful to have Doreen Seltzer viewing the lecture with us this evening. She's been a loyal friend of the Fisher Library for many years. She was one of the first people I actually met when I came here uh, 10 years ago in August. Um, and, and she's been a wonderful, wonderful friend of the Fisher and of the libraries. And I believe also her son Gareth and her daughter-in-law Monique are with us, so I want to welcome them as well. I also, on behalf of all of us, want to thank Mrs. Seltzer for establishing this lecture and supporting it for more than two decades. We very much appreciate being able to host this annual talk on the theme of collecting and bookselling, which continues to bring so many knowledgeable and stimulating speakers to share their expertise uh, and knowledge about their collections with our community. This is the second year that the Seltzer Lecture is delivered online. While we miss coming together in person and enjoying each other's company and, and the hors d'oeuvres and the wine and, and the wonderful ambiance in the Fisher Library, we are grateful to have these digital tools that allow us to be virtually together. They've also made it possible for us to engage with communities across campuses, across the GTA in Canada and literally from around the world. I would encourage you to invite your friends, no matter where they may be, to join us for an online lecture during this time when, we're not, when we are unable to attend events in person. By way of updating, the university and the libraries have worked very hard to ensure safe and healthy re-entry to the library spaces, which is of now are still under capacity, some capacity restrictions and, so, and physical access is currently limited to students uh, and active faculty and researchers. Um, our transition back to in-person services is gradual and steady as we seek to make every effort to help to protect the health and safety of our users. It has, I will say, been an absolute delight to be able to welcome students back to campus this fall. They're excited to be here. It's wonderful to feel the energy of a full campus, uh, to feel the energy of the libraries as students uh, after almost two years are re-entering the libraries uh, to study, to use our collections, to do research, uh, to, to work with the extraordinary staff that make up the U of T libraries. Uh, more than 10,000 students are entering Robarts Library on a heavy day. That's actually half the amount of a normal heavy day pre-pandemic, um, but you can just see the excitement and the engagement of those students as they're coming into the libraries. Um, we very much look forward to the day when we can welcome the return of our in-person friends events. And in the meantime, meantime, we're very grateful for our ability to gather here virtually. So thank you all again for being here this, this evening. And again, thanks so much to Mrs. Seltzer for making this event possible. And now I'd like to invite Laura McDonald, the Associate Chief Librarian for Special Collections and director of the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library to introduce and welcome tonight's lecturer, Garrett Herman, to whom we are grateful to have with us this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, and welcome everybody. Um, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Garrett Herman. Garrett is an investment banker, a philanthropist, and a word, world authority on all things Darwinian. Garrett collected more than 5,000 volumes of Darwin's works, many of which he donated to the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library in 2018. His personal collection of Darwin's works is an invaluable resource um, for scholars of Darwin's groundbreaking contributions to evolutionary theory. A man of many charitable causes, Garrett is the founding chairman of the Charles Darwin Foundation of Canada now known as the Galapagos Conservancy Canada. For his work and for his collecting, Garrett was awarded a Doctor of Laws from the University of Edinburgh in 2014 and from Concordia University in 2016. This evening, Garrett will be discussing Darwin and Me, 
So he'll be discussing his the origins of his fascination with Charles Darwin and how he built one of the greatest private collections of Darwin related materials in the world. Garrett will tell us about um, collecting as well as the many events and people he met along the way, all thanks to Charles Darwin. Um, but before we begin uh, the lecture, I just wanted to remind you um, that there will be a question and answer period after the lecture, as with all of our lectures. And uh, we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, and you don't have to wait until the end of the lecture. You can certainly um, put your questions in the Q&A as they arrive. And also just to let you know as well that there's actually um, live captioning as well. So now over to Garrett, Garrett and to Darwin and me. Thank you. Laurel, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I'd, um, I have to tell you how pleased I am to have uh, been offered this opportunity to um, give the 23rd annual John Seltzer Mark Seltzer Memorial Lecture. It's uh, quite a privilege and I hope you enjoy it. So um, we might as well get going. So we're going to go right back. That's me on the right. I, I used to be a cute young man. And um, we were, um, that's my friend Ronald. And as um, youngsters, and I think I was probably about seven years old or something like that, we used to uh, borrow money from our parents and go to the bank and break a $10 bill into pennies. And then we'd bring them home and we'd go sort through them and take out the dates that we didn't have. And then we'd go roll them all up again and then go back to the uh, bank and turn the pennies into nickels. Anyway, you can imagine how um, we uh, lost our favoritism at the bank very quickly when um, we kept bringing these shoddy rolled coins back, you know, and then kept asking for more. Anyway, um, needless to say, after a short period of time, we uh, became quite, um, you know, in possession of uh, nice little collections. So we're going to leave Ron aside now. I didn't see him after that. He moved out of the neighborhood. And it was about a 40-year break before I talked to him again. And we're going to get back to him towards the end. So um, we're going to fast forward to 1990 when I had just separated and I was in an apartment. And the apartment was uh, pretty well empty. And I uh, started to buy a little furniture. One of the things I bought was an antique bookcase. And um, I got the wild idea that an antique bookcase should have. So I um, came across this... Um, Printing in the Mind of Man, which is a bibliographic piece that goes over 500 years of important printed books. And uh, I thought, gee, wouldn't it be neat to buy first editions of books that are in the PMM, as they call it. Anyway, I set about that adventure, and I started buying some of the obvious ones. Um, the founder of the Salvation Army, Booth, Jeremy Bentham, who was a student of Adam Smith, uh, Darwin, Freud, Galton. Anyway, he, I was going on my uh, merry way when I started to realize that this book collecting wasn't as simple as just buying a few first editions because in the, um, like John Harrison, for example, uh, he wrote uh, How to Build a Timekeeper and he was in a big contest uh, to uh, discover how to deal with longitude uh, and avoid all the shipwrecks that were taking place. Anyway, I was introduced to um, his competitor, uh, a fellow by the name of Masculine, and of course I had to start buying his books. So before I knew it, all of these books had other connected people. So I started buying those books. But then I really had a, an epiphany when I realized that what good is the first edition of The Origin of Species if you don't have the other five that were revised during Darwin's lifetime. So while I thought I was going to have one book, now I got six. And in the case of Adam Smith, he revised Wealth of Nations two times during his lifetime. So 
I started to expand quickly and um, then I realized that there's also languages involved here. And in the case of the origin of species, the first origin in Spain, um, uh, the Spanish edition, Darwin enticed the publisher to publish an edition uh, by giving him new information. So the first edition of the origin in Spanish is, has got information in it that you don't find anywhere else. Anyway, so I went along my little merry way and I said, oh, the first Russian edition of The Origin. What's interesting there is that it was published within five years of the original English edition. And when you think that a publisher in Russia thought enough of the theory of evolution to publish an edition, it shows how advanced they were. Because a lot of other countries took longer than that to jump on board. Anyway, and then of course the first Hebrew edition of Descent of Man um, so my little bookcase was now way, way overflowing. And then of course there's bindings. So here's a, um, how to turn a um, $100 book into a $12,000 book. You get a guy by the name of Michael Wilcox to bind it. And that's a beautiful binding he did of one of my uh, limited edition um, books. Anyway, needless to say, I was out of control at this point. And I made a big decision. I had to focus. And I decided at that point to focus on Darwin and evolution. So everybody else I took to Christie's in New York. And I had a little sale of some of those great books, but they didn't fit in with my plan. So um, during this time, I started to look around for a house because my books were now I had, I had one room full of bookcases. They were all full. I had piles all over the place. So I thought I better find a home for me and my books. So I came across this house every day on my way to work and on my way home and it had a for sale sign. And it was there for the longest time. And um, I didn't realize why it was for sale for so long until after I bought it. Uh, in fact, I didn't really care what the problems were with the house because I was going to fully renovate it, and that's what I did. Anyway, I found out on one day when I wanted to go and see it, uh, they wouldn't allow me in, and I realized there was two feet of water in the basement that day. So uh, anyway, it didn't matter because I put in new pipes and I redid the whole house without um, hurting the original structure. Anyway, I want to, um, after I purchased the house, it was being renovated for about a year and a half. And during that period, I came across um, 60,000 copies of the Times of London. And that was a, a Toronto bookseller, David Lake, uh, Donald Lake, who um, said, there's something you have to buy. Anyway, uh, he led me to the basement of the um, Law Society of Upper Canada. And there in the basement, in a pile, where these folios, large folios, weighing as much as 50 pounds, were thrown into a heap on the floor. And it was the saddest thing. Anyway, I, um, about a year later, after taking them out of storage, moved them into my house with all my books. So what I want to do now is I want to take you on a little tour of my Darwin and Evolution libraries that were in my house. And um, I'll do that um, quickly. So after um, many visitors came, and they'd come into the Darwin Library and everybody seemed to want to talk about religion and it took away from what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about Darwin and I wanted to talk about what a great guy he was and all the good things he did and how important his works were but I'd be stuck talking about religion and all kinds of things. Anyway, I decided to set up a world religion library in my house and I filled it with all kinds of books, but also different religious icons. And if you notice in this picture here, uh, I bought stuff all over the world. There's a, I see an item there I bought in uh, Cambodia. Uh, there's a thing there, Ascoli Pacino in Italy. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of fun doing that. And um, as the years went on, more and more of these things came and the room was packed. Anyway, those uh, three statues in the window, I bought those in Hong Kong. Uh, that Tanjore print, with the light on it, I bought that in uh, Bombay, uh, Mombay. Um, 
Anyway, there's the a nice little history there. I had an old Bible, so I had a 1485 Bible. I had a, um, a Quran manuscript, a first edition in English of the Quran. You name it, I had it there. Um, there were some interesting stories that would come out of um, this room in that you see a menorah there. I was a little light on Judaica, and a friend of mine, Abe Schwartz, uh, was going to Israel on a trip, and he called me when he arrived back in Toronto, and he was at the airport. He said, are you home right now? I said, yeah. He said, well, I want to drop by, and I have a little gift for you. Anyway, that menorah sitting there was, came directly from Israel to go into my world religion library. Anyway, um, I would sit people down in that room, and we would go through their upbringing, uh, their religion, their family, how, what they felt today. And then when we left that room, I would make it clear that we're now into science and we're not going to be talking about religion anymore today. And it worked very well and it was very interesting um, what people had to say about their religious uh, history. And it's quite varied as you can imagine. So we now go into the Darwin Library uh, that painting over the uh, fireplace, I had that commissioned. It's a, it's a copy of a, a photograph that um, I bought at the National Portrait Gallery. And uh, that's the portrait of Darwin that's in the gallery. Anyway, um, if you look at the room, it was actually a dining room at one point. Uh, it still had a table when I was finished making it into a library. And I used it for dinners, so it, it was still a dining room. Uh, the books on the left, the, uh, those green books, those are all John Murray, the uh, English publisher. And the books on the right, the brownish, reddish ones, are Appleton. And uh, those are all the American editions. Anyway, the room was packed with all kinds of interesting, everything by and about Darwin. And um, I had lots of interesting visitors, one being Janet Brown. Jenna Brown's a Harvard professor who's very well known as Darwin's biographer. She did a beautiful uh, two-volume set of uh, Darwin's biography. And uh, anyway, she came for a visit, and she was really enamored with my wall of green, i.e. the John Murray published books. Um, Richard Dawkins came by one time. I had a good time with him in the religious library. Um, he started life as a Presbyterian. And uh, we went through his whole, you know, did a lot of traveling. His father, I think, was uh, an ambassador or something like that. So he, he lived in a lot of different countries. Very interesting fellow. Anyway, um, you know, these were uh, interesting people to sit down in a religious library and start asking them about their original beliefs and everything else. Anyway, um, here's somebody you might recognize, uh, Richard Landon, who used to come over quite often. And uh, this was on the occasion of, we hosted the Groyer Club of New York uh, to Toronto for a three-day visit. And um, we had an evening at my house. And um, you see the Groyer Club there, and it's an, an evening at my house. And I had books in all the rooms. And this was the guide. Four floors, and it told you what was in each room and how many seats, because it was a dinner, but we had like 60 people. So the dinner was a moving dinner. And I had staff that would take the food around and uh, they would find a chair in whatever room they happened to be in. So it was quite a, a fun evening. Anyway, that was um, done in concert with um, the Fisher and, um, and Richard and Marie. They all helped in this uh, endeavor. We had to keep these people busy for three days. Um, here's, uh, I had a guest book. So I have a, <clears throat> a guest book that is full of um, signatures of all the people that visited my libraries. As you'd expect in a Darwin library, you got some interesting Darwin material. <coughs> um, this is a situation where, um, I, I don't know if you know the story, but um, Darwin, of course, was sitting on his information with the Origin of Species without publishing it for like over 20 years. He was, you know, adding to his knowledge base every year, but he was reluctant to publish. And then along came Alfred Wallace, who sent him a letter and it said, you're an expert in this, please tell me what you think of my theory of evolution. So Darwin was horrified. 
that someone else was going to launch the whole idea of evolution, which Darwin had been sitting on for years. Anyway, um, they uh, ended up both publishing a letter, and it was published in red at the Linnaean Society at the same time. And this is the first edition in the Linnaean Society journal of those two letters. And I bought this from um, Jim Cummins in New York. Um, I'm going to mention book dealers from time to time. And I always, you know, people call book collectors hoarders sometimes. And then I think, well, you know, I'm starting to think of these book dealers. Uh, they're actually bigger hoarders than the collectors. Uh, in Jim Cummins' uh, case, he has a, a warehouse that I've never been to, but apparently it has over 100,000 books in it. So that's hoarding at a very high level. Uh, the Origin, the first edition. Actually, Jim Cummins got that for me at an auction in New York um, years ago. Here's um, the first edition of the, um, the um, Voyage of the Beagle. And uh, this was uh, bought at auction, and there was a, a book dealer in London by the name of Eric Korn. And uh, he's no longer with us, but he was a bit of a, um, an odd duck. He, um, every time I would go and visit him, he'd have many, many things that I was interested in. But not once did he send me a letter or a phone call and try to sell me something. Never. Anyway, um, he also was a very good friend of Dr. Oliver Sacks, and uh, he's the fellow that wrote the book, um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. So that's the kind of um, space that Eric liked to be in, like a little, little out there. Anyway, he obviously was a hoarder as well because he didn't want to sell anything to me. Anyway, um, the zoology, I bought it at an auction myself in uh, London, and it was a very nice copy. And it was actually at the Fisher in uh, 2009 when they had a Darwin exhibit celebrating the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth and the 150th anniversary of the publishing of The Origin. So that was in the, uh, there. Uh, here's an interesting book. It was just signed by a lot of family members. The book itself was nothing too special. Um, I had an honorary degree that Darwin received, one of 81 honorary degrees that he got. Uh, this one was from the Royal uh, Surgical Society and uh, it was all in that room. Uh, this is a letter. Um, you see that his letter, it's dated January 23rd, there's no year on it. And it says, Dear Sir. So you can imagine what it's like to figure out from his letters who they're to, what year they were. Anyway, that's something that's in the hands of the Darwin Correspondence Project at Cambridge. And they have um, set out for many years to sort out all these letters, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters, and try to put them all into the right context. Anyway, I was happy to be um, an advisory committee member there for four years. And uh, I gather they're just about finished with that project. So I look forward to the last edition. In my Darwin library, I had a, um, a um, model of the Beagle, which I had a fellow by the name of Trevor Phillip in, on German Street in London. He commissioned it for me, and it was all done to scale. And um, there's a picture there on the wall. It's uh, Julia Margaret Cameron. It's a photograph. And it's one of two that were taken. This is actually the rejected one. Talking about hoarders, I bought that from Jeremy Norman. And Jeremy Norman, when I had my sale, uh, when I sold some of my Darwin material, he went and bought it back. So there's a, it's gone the full circle. And I actually went to his house and I see it there hanging in a hallway. And it was quite nice to see it, but it just shows you that these booksellers are not they're, they're actually collectors, I think. Anyway, um, this is my beagle sitting here at the uh, Fisher in 2009. It was a um, nice exhibit. I had a, um, a fourth edition of The Origin, and it had Charles Kingsley's book plate in it. And uh, I always wondered, and there were annotations throughout the book, and I always wondered if it was Charles Kingsley. Anyway, I had a visitor come by one day that said he had a friend, a uh, friend Pierce Hale, who works at the University of Oklahoma, 
who's an expert on uh, Kingsley. So he said, let's just scan a couple of pages and send them to him. Anyway, sure enough, it was Kingsley's writing. And uh, he sent me that uh, carte de visite of Kingsley as a thank you because he wanted to see the book. So I actually lent it to him for a while. Um, here's an interesting item that was in the library. Um, this was, I bought this from Jonathan Gestetner of London at the New York Book Fair. And I was on strike at that point, i.e. didn't have any money to buy books. So Jonathan, uh, I did a fast tour through the exhibit and then I ran for the door to get out of there before anybody got a hold of me. Jonathan followed me out and said, I brought something from London for you. And it happened to be this piece. Anyway, I didn't buy it right away, but I bought it the next day. Anyway, it's a, um, uh, back in the late um, 19th century, the authors, British authors, that were published in the US had no royalties. And there was a lobby. And uh, on this document, you have uh, in print all the authors that were lobbying to change that rule. And every time they recruited a new author, they would take the old pamphlet and they would get the uh, author to sign it. So this one is signed by Charles Darwin. And I still have that today. Here's another book. Uh, I still have this one as well. Actually, I took it out of a sale. I, I got nervous. I didn't want to part with it at the last minute. This is the last book read to Darwin on his deathbed. And it was in his library. He read it many times himself. But uh, it's, it's written by Margaret Keynes there that, that um, she, it was in her, her family. Um, she married a Darwin. Uh, no, she is a Darwin who married. Um, Emma Darwin is, uh, is annotated in it. There's a letter to, uh, to Leonard uh, inside. So it's a real keepsake, and uh, it's, it's really amazing to have a book that I know Darwin had in his own hands. So now we're going to move to the 19th century library. And um, I'll just show you some of the items there. So of course, Alfred Wallace, I had a whole collection of his. Uh, Lyle, very important fellow for uh, Darwin, especially when he went to the Galapagos knowing the geology and understanding it as Lyle's uh, principles of geology explained made a big difference to Darwin. Asa Gray, uh, Harvard professor. He was uh, personally responsible for convincing Appleton to publish Darwin's works uh, in the US. So also an important supporter of Darwin. Uh, Nature magazine, uh, 1869 was founded. My older editions here I bought from a fellow in London, uh, Simon Finch. Now, he's the opposite of Eric Korn. He wants to sell you everything in the whole shop. And he did sometimes, just about. So um, he was a, an interesting fellow in that he used to date Sinead O'Connor. And he also posed nude on a book at some point called Naked London. I don't know. Anyway, these book dealers are, they're a different bunch. So after the 19th century library, we would uh, go downstairs and of course we'd have to go through the wine cellar. And um, usually we opened a bottle or two down there. And uh, then we would proceed to the Times, London Times Library. And um, for non-book collectors and non-book people, this was the most impressive room because it had 13 tons of newspapers that you wouldn't see probably anywhere else in a home for sure. Anyway, uh, that big table in the middle of the room, I had uh, three folios sitting on that at all times. One was uh, when Darwin published The Origin, there was an anonymous uh, review of The Origin in the Times. And of course, we know it was Huxley, but at the time, no one knew who wrote it. So I had that open on the table. Uh, the most important thing in, in that library, as far as I can tell. Um, and then I'd have two other books open. And they'd be open to 100 years ago today, 200 years ago today. So visitors to my house would have that to look at. And um, so a lot of fun there. Um, I might want to tell you why I bought the Times in the first place. Because of every day of Darwin's life in it. That's how I justified it. 
So there's always a justification for some of the odd things book collectors do. And that was my justification. Um, anyway, um, there's the review. So we're now going to go upstairs to the second floor to the 20th century library. But um, before I do, I want to explain about the Shrewsbury Public School commissioned this, this larger than life statue of Charles Darwin. And when I saw a picture of it, I thought, gee, maybe there's a maquette that the sculptor has that I could uh, have her bronze it and, you know, and sell it to me. So as luck would have it, Emma Pearson on the right there, she um, bronzed it. And then when she, she lived outside of London somewhere and she brought the maquette to show it to me in London and I brought Sarah Darwin along with me to look at it. And then when Sarah saw Emma, she remembered her from art school. They had gone to school together. So it was kind of a fun um, meeting. And Emma, after that, did a whole series of bronzes on the Galapagos and gave the Galapagos Conservation Trust a percentage of the sales. So it worked out for everybody, that introduction. So here we are in the 20th Century Library. It's um, got what you'd expect in it. Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about Richard Dawkins. When he came to my home for a visit, when he entered my house, I said, you know, Richard, don't forget to sign some of your books before you leave. And uh, he said, oh, you know what? I love signing books when I've actually met the owner. He says, I really don't like it when an author will sign 50 books and leave them in a bookstore. And everyone that comes by and buys one of those books takes it home and everybody thinks they met the author and they never met the author. So anyway, fast forward to we're now in the 20th Century Library and I, I, I said, you know, I'd like you to sign a couple of my books. I said, let's start with this one. Can you please re-sign this book? I had bought it signed and I had never met him. So he was very sheepish at that point. Anyway, he's written in that book, re-signed on the day of the visit. Anyway, that was fun. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, things like uh, the transcript of the, uh, the Scopes trial, I had all kinds of interesting things in that room. So I'm going to move now to an interesting story. Uh, in 2001, I received this book called Annie's Box in the mail, and it was from Randall Keynes. Now, Randall um, is related to the Darwins. Um, he's the great-great-grandson of Charles Darwin. And um, so he wrote this book about Annie, who's Darwin's daughter who died when she was about nine years old. And it's a bit of a sad story. And um, shortly after I received the book, I was going to London and I brought the book to read on the plane. And I have two daughters and I was reading about this young lady who's, she's eight years old and she's getting sicker and sicker and I know she's gonna die soon. Anyway, so I'm in, on the plane in the old days when you'd have a, a drink and read a book. Anyway, I got tears in my eyes and I had to fast forward to where she had already passed away and then I finished reading the book. Anyway, in London, I got a hold of Randall and we took a, a day and went to Downhouse. And I had a terrific day with him at Downhouse where um, he had stories about it when he was there as a child that you know, you'd only get from somebody that went there in the old days. Anyway, as we were leaving Downhouse, um, the curator came running after us and said, Randall, Randall, please come to my office. And we went to uh, her office and she handed Randall something and it was Annie's box. And Randall handed it to me. And I had it in my hand and then tears started to come again because this is Annie's box. It's a box that she used to put all her little trinkets in. This is a little girl, nine years old, and this was her whole life when she died, was all the stuff in this box. Anyway, it was a very sad but a very memorable and close connection to the Darwin family. Um, 2009 in Toronto, um, the movie Creation was uh, the premier movie for TIFF. And I went to it and I noticed on the stage after the movie, Randall was there. 
And uh, I texted him after I saw him, and uh, I never heard back. But the next day I was at lunch, and um, there's a picture of me at lunch because he showed up at my lunch. I guess he called my office and asked where I was, and then he just showed up. Anyway, it was quite exciting, and then I brought him to my house for a visit, and uh, here he is in my backyard having a glass of wine. That's what usually happened to people that visited my house. Anyway, this is a, a long story about collecting, the fun of it, the connections you can make, and I want to go back to my friend Ronald Cohen right now. I ran into him 40 years later, when I read about somebody that had donated some books to the National Library in Ottawa. And it was Ronald Cohn. I wondered, is this the same Ronald Cohn? So I sent him a note and he uh, ended up that it was him. And he came to Toronto and um, we met up and I brought him to my house. And he, um, as he was leaving, and I knew he was a book collector because you know, they, you can't move them forward on a tour. They want to look at everything. Anyway, uh, as he was leaving, he said, oh, by the way, I'm one of the biggest collectors of Sir Winston Churchill in the world. I said, what? This is a guy that I, when we were eight years old, we were collecting coins. And I've got this house full of Darwin and he's got a house full of Sir Winston Churchill. So he went a step further though. He wrote this bibliography of Churchill. It's a big three volume set, which is a really a, that's an enterprise. I can't imagine the work involved in that. Anyway, after many years, um, it was time for me to move out of my home. And uh, I had to part with some of my special goods. Here's um, some, um, the picture you have here now is, is a selection of, that Sotheby's put together to put in a sale in London. And uh, it's a sad moment. My front room is whitewashed, I can see. And um, anyway, here are the newspapers going to their new home. And um, it was quite a sad time to uh, give up a lot of this. But there's a good side to all of this. Over 5,000 of those volumes ended up right here in the Fisher. And I'm so happy to be back here and close to my books that are still here somewhere. There's a picture of me uh, at the Fisher a couple of years ago. Anyway, um, what I've done since Darwin, I had to obviously, you can't collect the way I was collecting and live in a condo. So I'm in a condo and I came up with a couple of new things to collect. And as I told my book collector friends what I was collecting, a lot of them really frowned on it. Like physiognomy, phrenology, mesmerism. What, what's that all about? Anyway, so I was taking a lot of heat from a lot of my book collecting friends until I came to the University of Toronto and Laurel MacDonald said, phrenology, we have a collection of phrenology. And I went over to the Fisher and she showed me a whole beds and the Fisher has got a great collection. And we're still working on PJ Carefoot to get him on side, but we're not sure if we'll be able to do that. Anyway, so it was fun to uh, do that. Um, now, I want to, um, like life after Darwin, I thought that a lot of my connections would go away and uh, I wouldn't, but I'm still thought of as if I still have those five libraries. Anyway, uh, Janet Brown came to Toronto uh, about two years ago now and uh, we had dinner and she had this beautiful little book. Uh, it's a Darwin quotes and I'm going to read one of the quotes to you right now and it fits in with my new collection. He says, afterwards, I'm becoming very intimate with Fitzroy. I heard that I had run a very narrow risk of being rejected on account of the shape of my nose. He was an ardent disciple of Lavater and was convinced that he could judge a man's character by the outline of his features. And he doubted whether anyone with my nose could possess sufficient energy and determination for the voyage. This is when Darwin was trying to get hired to go on the Beagle. But I think he was afterwards well satisfied that my nose had spoken falsely. And I'd like to end my little talk with that. Um, now I've put all my stories about Darwin in a little book that I've uh, humbly put together myself 
And it's got all, anything and anything that ever happened to me with Darwin is in that book. It's available in eight books. Anyway, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, and now I guess we'll have some questions and answers. Uh, hopefully I can answer the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Garrett. That was wonderful. So, so I do, I do have a, a few questions for you, um, and one of them is that um, you actually don't quite tell us why you became obsessed with Darwin. When you started collecting your first editions, looking at the list, you could have collected um, um, from. Um, Adam Smith or, or John Stuart Mills, why in particular from your big list did you actually focus in or decide to focus on Darwin? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, it didn't happen overnight. It was a slow process. And um, it happened mainly as I uh, bought these books, I would start to read them and I'd get to know the people. And uh, in the case of Darwin, he, I liked him at so many different levels. Um, it's fine, he was a great scientist, but he was also a great family man. And he was also very sensitive to people. He was also very humble. And he was born with a lot of money. Like he could have been a big shot on day one. He, uh, he's a guy that, uh, I mean, I feel like he's a friend of mine. And he's, he's honest. He had no bias in his work. He, uh, he was really a true star and he, he, he stood well above all the others. The others were all, they had one or two things that were great. And, you know, I mean, obviously these are all great people. The PMM had very famous and, and heavy contributors in that book, but Darwin on so many levels, uh, his treatment of his children, he'd let them play in his office when he was working. Like uh, there's 50 things I like about Darwin. Anyway, it, uh, I'm a fan, I love the guy. <laughs> um, so we have a question from our audience and that is um, someone who's obviously read your book and she says or asks, um, your book is so detailed. Did you actually keep diaries? I did not have diaries, but I did a lot of things that were um, sort of memorable, you know, like visits to Toronto, um, uh, my evolution dinners that I had, obviously, I, lo I looked in my guest book to find that, the dates. Uh, and just about every year we had sort of a birthday party, not always on February 12th, but as close to it as we could. And uh, towards the end, yeah, so I had a lot of, I had a lot of keepsakes. Uh, that's how I, I mean, I couldn't remember all those things, obviously. <laughs> So I have a question for my colleague, and he asked, um, was there an item that actually got away? Was there a holy grail of Darwin that you would have really have loved to have acquired? Well, it's, uh, it's always been very hard to play favorites when there were so many things I liked. And um, oddly enough, a book collector, I mean, book collectors sometimes even like the second copy of the same book. So... Try to explain that, you know, why you could have two or three copies of the same book. So it's a little bit of an illness, but I did pull the real favorite out of the pile. And uh, that was the uh, book, the last book read to Darwin on his deathbed. And uh, that's, that was a book called Wives and Daughters uh, written by Gaskell. Um, and there's a little story there that Darwin liked that book in, besides knowing Elizabeth Gaskell, uh, he also liked the story. It had, had to do with a young man who traveled around the world. And in many ways, he thought he was, might have been the subject of the book because it kind of matched his story a bit. So he actually read that book a number of times himself. And uh, it was one of his favorites. And I have his copy, which is unbelievable. It is, it is a very scientific Royal Society Victorian book um, for him to be reading. So I can, I can see, actually, I can see the parallels very, very well, very much. Right. Um, and actually, interestingly, somebody from the audience actually just asked you, um, what was the book that was read on his deathbed? So, so, so there we go. 
Um, I actually, oh, sorry. I wanted to, I can add a little to that. I wanted to um, buy a copy, like a first edition of Wives and Daughters, uh, which uh, this is not, but the type is so small, I had to buy a paperback to read it. I don't know how those people in those days could read no. because it was all, everything was so small, all the print. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, and it's, it's sort of shared by Alex Carter and me. Um, and that is you, you came to the Fisher several times to see the collection. Um, and we were imagining or wondering what would it be like for you as a donor to actually see your library, you know, your five libraries in another library, in an institution um, such as the Fisher. I would, I would, we were imagining how it would feel, but we're actually wondering how it feel, how it felt. Well, it's the second best outcome. It would have been better if I still had them, which it wasn't going to be, um, but it's um if you notice i came before they're even on shelves like i like to just sort of look at them like i live with those for uh, more than 20 years so seeing them at u of t where they're they're being respected is uh, a great honor so that's why i felt good every time i came there to see them and uh, the picture that i had in the slide with me standing in your stacks it's i'm very fond of that picture because it all has a happy ending. We like to think so, and we're grateful for that remarkable collection. So, um, so we have another question, and, and that is, if you buy an historic first edition uncut, would you cut the pages to read it? No, no. That would be a pristine copy, and uh, there's no need to read it. You can read, uh, there's lots of copies to read. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't cut it. I would leave it as, because that's really original. So we have another uh, question um, and uh, it states, and perhaps you could clarify this. Uh, when we, we heard that when Darwin and his wife were reading the same book, he would tear it in half so that each of them could read it at the same time. Do you know if that, that is the case? No, I don't know. Okay, they were glad they're saying that they were glad that it didn't happen to, to um, the last book he was reading. Yes. Um, we also have another question for you and that is, what is the skull beside you? Oh, well, phrenology is a, uh, well, you know, it's a study of the uh, bumps on the head. Um, and, it's, and it runs parallel to Darwin, a little earlier than Darwin, but a lot of the people that I knew through Darwin and that were in my 19th century library, actually had, I find myself actually, Laurel, buying some of those books back because some of them have chapters on phrenology. And um, anyway, because it's the bumps on the head and it's, you know, the, the phrenologist came up with the idea that the brain wasn't homogenous and that it was all at different uses. So I just, anyway, it's a plastic uh, model of a skull. I thought it would be fun to have along with the collection. And are you enjoying collecting in your new area? Yeah, and it's more to read. It's it's um, you know it's a whole new thing that I knew very little about, so it's fun. I'm trying to keep it down, like um, saying no more often than yes when I see something. But I did buy a, a phrenology cane the other day. You know, it, it's a the top of it is a phrenology head on it. That's I didn't need to buy that. Um, so we have another question for you, and it is, did you ever get into collecting contemporary supporters of Darwin who published their own books in support of evolutionary theories? Well, the 20th century library was full of that. Um, like I had, uh, well, you have them all now, most of them. Um, no, there, there are lots of them. I, I collected them all. Um, what, where did the beagle go to? Did you, did you still keep the, the beagle, your model? No. That was a bit large. It, it, it took up a lot of space. When I first had it, it was about three feet long and it's in a big case. 
And I, when I, I did have a sale at Sotheby's and they did want to have an interesting sale. So they wanted not only books, they wanted some paraphernalia and uh, ephemera. So that went, um, it looked nice. Um, I started out having it in the middle of my dining room table. So it was, um, you know, I felt like it was a bit like it would look at U of T. You know, you walk in and there's room and there's this model on the table. But anyway, um, no, I, they asked me to sell it and I did. Um, we have another question for you and that is, did you collect critics of Darwin, um, including yeah. the creationists? Yes. Uh, the, um, I went to the Creation Museum even and bought things out of their bookstore and put them in my religion library. Uh, so yes, and Robert Owen, for example, I had all, a lot of his books. I had all his critics, the critics as well, yep. Um, so you were sort of alluding to collectors as, as hoarders <laughs> and booksellers as hoarders. Um, and, and you're going on to collect different types of materials now. Um, what do you think, uh, what do you think is the mentality of, of a book collector or is there one? Is it about the chase of the book? Is it the love of the, the actual creator or publisher or printer of the book or the book uh, cover designer? Um, what, what can you tell us about the psychology of a collector? Yeah. So for just a comment on the hoarding, it's a suspicion. I don't, you know, I, I don't know every dealer, but I know enough of them that have big, big libraries. So it is a suspicion, probably a good one. Um, as far as the, um, uh, the other part of the question, um, what was that again? Um, I guess just the psychology of, of oh, yeah, psychology. Is, is there sort yeah. of a unified psychology yeah. there? Well, there's different ways to collect. Some, some collectors come in and they buy first editions and uh, that's sort of a show me library. Whereas there are some completists or people that want to have it all, like all different editions, all different, and, and read the books and become very familiar with them. Um, so that's a different kind of thing. But these, the real scary part about all this is when I would go to a book fair and I'd come home with a book that had nothing to do with evolution. That's the part that I worry about. You know, you're supposed to be there looking, and there's always things on evolution and Darwin. And, uh, but I'd come home with a, uh, you know, a, a, a book, you know, a Hunter Thompson book, you know, signed by him. Now, what am I doing with that? It has nothing to do with this. So it is a bit of a problem. And the, um, the psych, I don't know if it's a psychiatric problem, but it is a problem. And at least it's a good one. It's very wholesome and you learn a lot. So I think it's great. I don't think we have any more questions from the audience other than Garrett, lots of thank yous for your frank and, and engaging presentation. Um, we do have um, a lovely note from um, Garth Seltzer and Mrs. Seltzer saying that, asking you actually, if you let your grandchildren um, play in your office. I would if I if I had any. <laughs> yeah, I would for sure. Oh, we actually have another one more question actually, and that is: Are there many connection Canadian connections in your nineteenth um, century collection, such as uh, Dawson? Well, my new collection there's uh, Adam Crabtree, who wrote the bibliography on mesmerism. Happens to be in Toronto. I met him through you actually, Laurel. As we say, we actually do have Adam uh, Crabtree's um, archives in the Fisher now, so. Yeah. Um, we have another question too. What is the strangest piece of Darwinia that you've found? Wow. Well, he wrote a lot of books that were like on worms and, uh, you know, mollusks and the, the sex lives of, uh, you know, different animals like he, emotions of animals like his books themselves are kind of uh you know very different and uh like there's not one area he uh 
you know, he covered the whole gamut of thought. So I think Garrett, that's that's the last of our questions. Again, other than lovely kudos, um, thanking you for such a memorable um, presentation and and for capturing, I think, the essence of a collector, a passionate collector, collector um, as well as Darwin. So we're incredibly um, grateful for you for this talk. And we're also incredibly grateful for you to um, donating um, your wonderful library to us in the Fisher. So thank well, you. Thank, thank you for that. And I enjoyed this a lot. Thank you. Um, so before I, I let you all go for the evening, um, I just wanted to thank Garrett once again for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I also wanted to thank um, Mrs. Seltzer for, um, for sponsoring this talk and, and um, allowing us to bring in wonderful speakers such as Garrett um, every year. Um, but I also wanted to provide you some updates on the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library as well. I think Garrett knows this, but um, it's with very mixed feelings um, that I announced that PJ Carefoot, the head of the Rare Book um, and Special Collections is retiring from the University of Toronto Libraries as of January um, 1st, uh, 2022. And PJ joined the Fisher in 2002 as the librarian responsible for medieval materials, early books and theological collections. In 2017, uh, PJ became interim head, and then in 2019, he became head of Rare Books and Special Collections. Um, under PJ's leadership, Rare Books um, acquired many notable new additions to its already outstanding collections, including the French Caxton and the English Caxton, um, as well as just being an excellent librarian. PJ is a tremendously wonderful mentor, role model, and teacher. And we're so grateful for all that he's done on our behalf and for the opportunity um, to have worked with him. So um, I hope that you'll all join me at some point when we can uh, to thank PJ for his wonderful service and his tremendous friendship. Um, we wish him a very long, a very happy and a very healthy retirement. Um, and certainly while PJ will be leaving us in January, he won't go far away. Um, because um, in the summer of 2022, he'll be curating with our colleagues Nadav Sharon and Tim Perry um, an exhibition on um, manuscripts um, at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. And also just to provide you an update as well as about um, the Fisher um, operations in general, um, staff have returned to site on September 7th. Um, however, our doors remained um, closed, uh, literally. Um, they've actually, the revolving doors have been replaced uh, with, or will be replaced rather with more accessible sliding doors. Um, and we do hope to welcome researchers um, back in the next few weeks, as long as um, public health rules and contractors um, will allow. So please stay tuned um, from when we'll be open for researchers. And finally, while we may not be able to see you in person, we can certainly still see you um, virtually and stay connected with you. Um, the new season of Between Two Pillars starts tomorrow. Um, and as you may know, Between Two Pillars is a casual conversation between uh, John Shoesmith, our outreach librarian, with a Fisher staff member about materials from our collections that they might um, have an interest in. And um, the, it is broadcast um, every second Friday at 12.30 p.m. on Fisher's YouTube channel. And tomorrow is the first broadcast of the season and um, it will be PJ. And PJ will be discussing his favorite items from the collections, items that he loved working with throughout his career. Um, and I had a sneak peek at the book truck that he had pulled out and, and it's some really wonderful and fascinating items. And so I know that PJ and, and John um, will have a um, a wonderful event, um, a wonderful session tomorrow at 1230 um, as well. Um, and um, just so you know as well, um, all of our friends of the Fisher lectures are actually recorded um, and they will be, they are made available um, on the Fisher Rare Book Library's website um, and um, Garrett's recording um, will be made um, accessible and available soon as well. And I think uh, that's all of my news for the evening. 
Um, I just wanted to thank you all. Uh, a profound thanks to Garrett for being such a wonderful um, and engaging speaker. Um, thank you so much um, to Doreen Seltzer and to Gareth and to Monique as well um, for being so wonderful and making events such as this um, possible. Now, if we were here in person, um, we'd be able to um, go now and have some wine and have some hors d'oeuvres from Daniel and Daniel. Um, but until we're able to do that again, um, I hope that you all stay well um, and that you stay um, and that you and your family stay healthy as well. So take care and um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. So thank you everybody and good night.